Criminal Behaviorology. To assist the criminal and civil justice systems. To improve our society. A podcast like no other. Here is your host, Timothy Joseph. Hello, I am your host for Criminal Behaviorology, Timothy Joseph, and I had come across a video on serial killers and, uh, you know, these kind of shows where they have some talking heads on there and and they have some they have some guests that uh, give some knowledge and information about the subject matter and one that was particularly good is a uh, Dr. Eric Hickey and I had uh, looked up some information on him it said Dr. Hickey has considerable field experience working with the criminally insane psychopaths sex offenders and other habitual criminals Internationally recognized for his research on multiple homicide offenders, Dr. Hickey has published and lectured extensively on the etiology of violence and serial crime. His research is often the subject of newspaper, radio, and television interviews, including National Public Radio, Larry King Live when it was on, A&E, BBC, Good Morning America, Court TV, Discovery, and some learning channel documentaries. Dr. Hickey frequently speaks to school and community organizations and provides training seminars for school psychologists and counselors in addressing crime and the deterrence of violence. A former consultant to the Unabom Task Force, Dr. Hickey assists various law enforcement and private agencies and testifies as an expert witness in both criminal and civil cases. So on the some of the things that we went over, his some of his work, serial murderers and their victims, sex crimes and paraphilia, the myth of the psychiatric crime wave, and controversial issues in criminology. So we talked about his interest in forensic psychology, how this field has grown over the years, his work in the Jeffrey Dahmer case, and a particular interest in necrophilia, the subject of geographic profiling. Of course, I had to ask him about the Unabomber case, the uh, realities of mentally ill defendants, and the murky nature of the insanity defense, and some other subject matters like, uh, you know, is prostitution a victimless crime? Should drugs be legalized? So this was a wide-ranging interview. Covered a lot of topics, more than I expected. And so I'm just going to go ahead and move right to the interview. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Dr. Hickey, may, may I ask, so you are a, you're a clinical psychologist? No, I am not. Thank heavens. Okay. Uh, I am a criminal, psycho- I'm a criminal psychologist. Sometimes I'm just a criminal, but today I'm a criminal psychologist slash criminologist. So, depends on what state I live in. Someplace I'm called a forensic psychologist. Uh huh. Um, I, I was I was a dean for ten years at university in a forensic psychology pro- program, a forensic studies program, mm-hmm. and now I work in a, in a PhD program at Walden University, mm-hmm. where I am of course senior course faculty in a forensic psychology program. Mm-hmm. And that's become. Have you seen forensic? Or criminal psychology become more popular uh, through the years? Oh my, yes. I have seen French psychology, which is historically been known as sort of an intersection of disciplines, mm-hmm. not a discipline in itself, but it, you know, it's an intersection with business and, psych- and, and sociology and, and education and psychology, so an intersection of disciplines. Today, I would say that it has become its own discipline, mm-hmm. uh, new, but, but but it's on discipline with all kinds of them. We have journal articles, journal, journals, and, and we have organizations. We have uh, uh, all kinds of specializations within forensic psychology. So it, it truly has become its own uh, mix of criminology, mm-hmm. sociology, psychology, mm-hmm. and now a little bit of I.O., special organization, mm-hmm. some of that, uh, and some, some criminal justice stuff. But it's, 
it's, it's kind of a, a very different way of approaching uh, crime and, and, and victimology. Mm-hmm. And I'm a behavior analyst, and so I've tried to uh, uh, address forensic psychology from a behavior analytic perspective, which is kind of what yeah, we've tried yeah, to exactly. focus on. Yeah, exactly. That's what I do. Uh-huh. I also am a behavior analyst. That's what I do. Is that somebody say, some people say, well, Dr. Hickey, are you a profiler? Mm-hmm. I said, well, I never go to court. I'm an expert witness in court. I never go to court and say I'm a criminal profiler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do that. that. That's not what I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a tool in my toolbox. Right. And if I'm good at criminal profiling, I can do other kinds of profiling, sure. Mm-hmm. But there's lots of other things I do besides that. Criminal profiling is not a, a career, it's a, it's a tool in a toolbox. Yeah. yeah. And uh, to what do you attribute this increased interest and in development in the field of criminal, forensic psychology, clinical criminology, whatever we want to call it? Sure. Well, I would say that technology has really advanced our work. Mm-hmm. We know a lot more about criminals today than we ever did before. We have DNA that's that's, that's really helped us catch criminals, um, but also the the understanding with with technology, um, we're able to uh, do ge- geographic profiling, and, and we we know the kinds of offenders who do certain types of crimes, and the victim mm-hmm. selection, the victim offender relationship. So that's mm-hmm. a big part of it. Another big part is media. Of course, the media hypes that they don't get it straight all the time. Often they don't, but they they do try. And they mm-hmm. have really helped promote, because everyone has an interest in the dark side. Mm-hmm. So I talk the dark side. Mm-hmm. Um, people want to sit in the living rooms and solve crimes, and, you know, they, they find it all very titillating. But, but it is fascinating. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I did a lot of serial killers in my career, mm-hmm. rapists and child mothers and pedophiles, mm-hmm. stalkers, uh, paraphiliacs. You name them. I, I've interviewed them and, and researched them. Uh, and I, I must say, to this day, I find it really fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'm not a groupie. I, I certainly, I just want to know, I want to find out what, what is the truth about these people? Mm-hmm. What drives them to do things that I would never do? Mm-hmm. What is it about that that is attractive to them? And what, what gets me from A to B? Mm-hmm. Uh, from being from the day they're in the womb until the day they die, mm-hmm. what makes them tick? And so that's my life's work. Do you think there's something about modern life that's a connection to the the rise of serial murder as a as a common fairly common crime what do i think oh, i'm sorry could you rephrase that question please? yeah is there something in in our modern lives modern technology the way we live today that's 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 been a factor in the rise yeah, of serial murder yeah well part of it is that that we have access we have we have high concentrations of urbanization 80 percent of americans live in urbanized areas, I think that that is a really big part of it. Uh, so we, the, the population density brings us closer together. It's easier to victimize people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have a lot more things to victimize them about. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, have a lot more things to steal and to rob and, you know, to, so technology has scam people online, social media scam. So the, the opportunities are there. It's like before we had the internet and I was around before the internet, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people just were on their own. Like, like for example, incels. You can know with incels. Right. That, that's the... Uh, the incel population, you know, we used to just call them losers. Uh-huh. Today, there's 40,000 of them online, and they're organized. And, and we know from research that some of those incels become active shooters. Uh-huh. They become serial rapists. Mm-hmm. So, well, the FBI watches them, mm-hmm. and, and keeps track of them, and, and, and rightly so. So we're doing research on them now. Mm-hmm. Um, so advancement technology has been a big step mm-hmm. in helping create this whole field of forensic psychology, of course. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, DNA. Um, mm-hmm. the, the psychobiology of criminality is just absolutely fascinating. And, but also sociology in terms of where people live, how they live, groups mm-hmm. of people. Um, so it all comes together. Mm-hmm. It's the uh, sort of the, the sciences that come together to help us understand how did we get there? Because mm-hmm. we can't exclude biology, mm-hmm. uh, we can't exclude even genetics. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we have to consider what are some of the you know the the factors that might influence predispose people to criminality, and then where does it go from there? And so today, because we know a lot more than we ever did before, mm-hmm. um, we can shine light on areas that we didn't know about. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example, but it's very dark. 
Yeah. A, a very yeah. dark example. Yeah. yeah. You want you want a really dark example? Sure. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I interview necrophiles. Right. Necrophilia is actually a pretty common crime. Mm-hmm. Uh, law enforcement doesn't report it so much. You know, they, they they get the guy. They know he's been in grave, but they don't really talk about the fact that he's a necrophile. Mm-hmm. Um, about forty percent of necrophiles work in mortuaries and funeral parlors and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I were a necrophile, that's where I'd work. Uh, be a pathologist. Necrophilia is a very interesting. thing. Why would somebody want to be? A sexual relationship with, with body parts, or, or with an actual corpse, mm-hmm. or or a skeleton, and so I started exploring that a little bit more. And I had a, I was involved with the Jeffrey Dahmer case for mm-hmm. a while, and I actually met his brother and his mom, mm-hmm. and his mother. And I asked her, uh, I asked her specifically, I wanted to know after Jeffrey killed his first victim, mm-hmm. uh, what, why did he kill anybody else? What, what did he do for the next six years? So I wanted to know what was going on with him. I mean, I said, I told her, I said, you know, uh, and her name is Rocky, and she's now deceased, but mm-hmm. I wanted to know, I understand, that he had to have been doing something. She said, well, this, this didn't come out at trial, but I'll tell you. He would, he would find newspapers uh, looking for funerals of, of young men. Mm-hmm. And then he would attend the funerals. He would go to the viewings mm-hmm. of bodies. He would go to the funerals. He would go to the actual uh, interments and burials, and then at night he dig them up, you dig them up to have sex with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, that made that truly helped me understand because I, I was pretty sure that's that would be her answer. Mm-hmm. And then, then that tended to help set, set the stage for him to go on. Mm-hmm. So then later I went on to interview a, a, a serial killer who is also a a necrophile, and the law enforcement thought he was a psychopath. Mm-hmm. And the truth is that you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a necrophile who's a psychopath. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because necrophiles have attachments. Yes, they have attachments sometimes to living people, like to their moms, but they also have attachments to dead people. But they have attachments. Mm-hmm. Whereas a true, a true psychopath does not have any emotional attachment right. in, in, in any healthy way at all to anybody. Right. Um, and so... How you interview, how you interview a, psych, a, a necrophile is very different than how you interview, say, a, like I said, Bundy, who was a true psychopath. Right. Uh, that that was that, that exploration uh, led me to meet some other folks in the field uh, who were interested in the subject, and as a result, we did this international book on necrophilia called Understanding ne- uh, Necrophilia, mm-hmm. an international uh, exploration of, of that that topic, and it has been quite a journey to understand that dark side. Mm-hmm. But it, it's been a little, and so now we've had to do this to science by understanding these kinds of people and where they are and the kind of things they do for occupations and, and what drives them uh, to do what they do. Mm-hmm. I was in a, a site, what they called it abnormal psychology then, but I was in a class and uh, the subject of the paraphilias and necrophilia came up and one young lady in the class was just perplexed that something like that could even happen. And our professor, who, who was somewhat of a behaviorist, uh, he said, well, it, it could very well be something like there's a there's a shaping to it. You're with the bodies, you wash the bodies, you clean them. There's kind of a strange affection toward these bodies, and that develops into this kind of a, a step-by-step, incremental steps into this behavior. That was his kind of brief explanation. Do you, is there any other well, better explanation you would give yeah. for, for necrophilia? Oh, yes. So, so there's different kinds of necrophile. Mm-hmm. So there's a type, uh, the fellow that I interviewed, it's good, and mind you, they don't kill their victims so they the victims will suffer. They're not, they're not interested in suffering the victims. Right. They want the victims to die quickly, and they're not interested in suffering. Mm-hmm. So this guy kills a lot of victims, a lot of college students. As soon as he killed them, he hit them up in the woods, put them on the ground, strangled them mm-hmm. from behind, always from behind. He never saw them die because mm-hmm. he wasn't sadistic. As soon as they died, he had, he had sex with them while they're still warm. Uh-huh. So that's one type of necrophile who wants them warm so they're like their life like, mm-hmm. but there's not going to be any, any rejection. Whereas the, the, the second type that um, I came across, like the Three River Killer, he would kill his victims, again, 
no no suffering for the victim. They want me to die very quickly. Right. Then he would bury them for a couple of days until they cooled off. Mm-hmm. Then he would get them up and have sex with them mm-hmm. and mutilate the corpses. So that's a different kind of thinking, a different kind of attachment, but he did, he did have an attachment. And then the third type, and I've got a photograph of this, this guy who has 20, 29 skeletons in his closet. He was an expert in graveyards and cemeteries, and he goes, but he would dig them up. Uh, he'd take a field in there for 25 or 30 years and put the skeletons of young women in, in his bedroom, and he'd get other newly dead graves and, and get those people out and get their clothes, and he'd, he'd dress these skeletons in these clothes. He had 29 young women dressed in clothes in his bedroom. Mm-hmm. And, and but, so he wasn't killing anybody, but he wanted to be with them. You can, okay, let's, let's go to a, a more, uh, today, you can go to San Francisco, L.A., there's prostitutes who specialize in paraphilia. Uh-huh. Some go in, some go into necrophilia, so, that, so they'll ice themselves down. They put powder on themselves. They call them the coffins. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you don't, and if you call them on top and don't perform very well, nothing happens. There's no rejection. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Jeff Dumble was that way. He, the idea of being, the idea of a human relationship uh, is so intense. Uh, being with someone, actually communicating with someone. Expressing oneself, the fear of rejection and, um, is, is so severe that they're more comfortable being with someone who is not responding that way. Right. Uh, and that was, you know, Jim Donnelly was one of those kind of guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can name you several others who uh, have, you know, were necrophiles, the true necrophiles. These would be some of my dabble in a little bit uh, out of curiosity. There are those who prefer that mm-hmm. because they're more comfortable with someone who's actually dead. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a magazine in, um, Called Grooving Corpses out of L.A. Really? Um, that specializes in, in taking pictures of young women with corpses. Uh, actually, some guy, one guy died a few years ago and donated his body. So they use his corpse and they take pictures of themselves with this. This guy may be wear, you know, short shorts and so on and tank tops and you know, the pretty women with, with these corpses. And those magazines go very, very well. They're called Grooving Corpses. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting <laughs> area. It's very dark. But yeah. And it is, it is repulsive. I, yes, I get that. But forensically speaking, I mean, it's the kind of thing that we want to know about. Mm-hmm. We don't want to ignore it because it's, it's, it's stageful. We need to understand what drives people. Mm-hmm. But then if we understand it, then we can say, well, if, if this is causing it, if it's lack of attachment, mm-hmm. where is it happening? Well, it's probably happening in the home. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then we explore those kinds of areas where they, 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 they actually for, for, uh, formulate mm-hmm. within the home. Mm-hmm. So... Oh, it's it's been an interesting journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, sounds like it. Sound like that gentleman you described earlier truly had some skeletons in his closet. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no pun intended. Right. They were they were spoken. Yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of jokes. <laughs> yeah. 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 True. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, uh, it seems like so many serial killers have a fixation, really powerful fixation, on a, what you might call a sexual perversion at an early age. Has, is that something you found? Yes. Well, two-thirds of serial killers are sexual perverts. Uh-huh. Or well, two-thirds. And so a lot of them get into paraphilia. Uh, you know when men get into paraphilia, they'll explore with three, four, five paraphilia at different times. And some are, are not criminal. You know, I, and I don't really care about the non-criminal stuff. You mm-hmm. won't get into latex and furries. I don't care about that. Mm-hmm. Plushies and so on. But um, but the men who get into, like, border extraditionism, fraudism, somnophilia, when they get into these, these types of offenses, you know, they're progressing. And, they're, 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 and this is the area that, we, that people have ignored for many years. And something I'm getting into much more is understanding their fantasies. Mm-hmm. Because, they, because there's the Apparently, you have three components. The etiology, where does it come from? What is the actual fantasy that's going on? Mm-hmm. And then what's the behavior? Mm-hmm. Well, we always do the behavior, but we don't go back to explore what, what were the fantasies that got in there. Mm-hmm. So it, it's uh, imperative that we understand uh, that uh, these, these guys develop them early on in life. Usually, there's their childhood trauma. Sometimes there's trauma in the womb. There's what they call it, you know, Pavlov's skin skip, a little shock. Mm-hmm. where they, they couldn't escape from things that happened to them, mm-hmm. the child molestation and other kinds of things. You know, of course, there's neglect and there's all kinds of things. Fact is, I mean, that's a whole other story, but the things that develop in childhood, the childhood trauma, they can set the stage. And, and most kids are pretty resilient. They mm-hmm. get through it. 
and they somehow deal with their issues. Mm -hmm. But there are some who don't have the coping skills. Mm -hmm. They don't have the physical or psychological coping skills to handle the stressors. And so as they get older, they go through puberty. And we know that that, um, when we look at young men, from research, we know that 99% of all young men, by the time they reach the age of 18, have pretty much masturbated themselves into oblivion. Okay, that's typical, normal behavior. Well, guys do that. So normally what people do, a guy do, they, they fantasize. Mm-hmm. But most guys don't fantasize about killing children or, or cutting up animals or burning down houses. But these guys who do that, because of their trauma, childhood trauma, then they, they become fixated on those types of behaviors, and, and so that, they're drawn toward that, that part of it, that dark side. And so by the time they reach age, say, 15 or 16, if they're doing these kind of things, it's too late. I mean, they're going to keep going, and, uh, and they're gone. Mm-hmm. So that's what early intervention is really, really important. Mm-hmm. I once got the idea, just the impression, uh, that's all I would describe it, but the, the increase of uh, serial killers that came about uh, in 1970s through the 80s, that by that point you had an entire generation of people that had grown up uh, with the interstate highway system in place and that that produced the opportunity. Yeah, people yeah, had really become familiar yeah. with it. They'd become... Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. Go ahead, I'm sorry to cut you off. That's all right. I mean, that they had become familiar with it. It it was, in effect, a behavioral cusp. They could now easily travel, and then that led to, in combination with these other factors you described, the potential for serial murder, that you would have this big watershed or this big increase because that generation of people had now come into place and they were now acting out their skills with their opportunities. Well, yes and no. Mm-hmm. So, yes, uh, it did give, give people access. But most serial killers are not traveling. Mm-hmm. Most of them are, are local. They stay within the area that they're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. There are some that traveled around. I mean, the FBI did this big interstate um, uh, serial murder study, and they, they found like four or 500 cases mm-hmm. where, where it happened. But there are thousands of cases we have of serial murder. So, that is one way that people access. Mm-hmm. But again, most of them are more local. Mm-hmm. Uh, they find their, they find a certain types of victims. They choose to, like like if you're if you're traveling in the highways, you can pick up prostitutes. Right. And so that's low what we call low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the, in the terminology we use, like in at gas stations, we call them you mm-hmm. know lot lizards. Mm-hmm. And and these gals who are there looking for cheap cheap sex, you can make a little quick quick money. And so these guys, these traveling guys, you know, they pick the trucks and things, we'll pick them up, take them, you know, and second them in one state, kill them in another state, and dump them in a third state. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to track those. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. But they're not the majority of serial killers. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of them, like I said, the local types stay within a county or two or three counties in, their, in that area, mm-hmm. and they have a sort of hunting patterns mm-hmm. that they go on. If you look into the geophysical profiling, you'll see how serial killers tend to hunt depending upon their preference for victims. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're going after college students, that's one thing. If you're going after prostitutes, that's another, and so on. So, again, um, it, gets, you know, it gets pretty complicated when you get into, down into the, uh, the final aspects of it. Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned uh, the geographic profiling, and that's from uh, uh, Kim Rosmo, uh, Rosmo in uh, Canada. Had uh, I believe he was the one. I'd yeah. met him before. He's the one that had developed that. Yeah, so Ken Rossimo, I consider a good friend. Mm-hmm. Um, I met him back, went back when he was doing his dissertation, and I shared my, my data set with him. Kim is a brilliant man. Mm-hmm. And he, to me, he's the father of geographic profiling, really came up with some great thoughts and, and um, great hunting patterns of them and so on. Um, and he was able to, um, in one case, he had, there were three rates, because we knew a lot about the types of victims they, he, he, the, the offender had selected. Mm-hmm. We knew Given the type of victimology, we knew the type of rapists that, he, that we were looking for, that he was looking, they were looking for, law enforcement. And because of that, he was able to predict mathematically on a computer the area of the city the guy would be living in, the offender. Mm-hmm. Not only did he pick the area of the city, he, picked, he actually picked the, the, the street and the house number. Uh-huh. And he was correct. Mm-hmm. And that's science. Right. Now, now, we can't do that all the time, but we're getting, we're getting much better at this. 
Uh-huh. So remember that profiling used to be just junk uh-huh. 30, 35 years ago. That became junk science, and now it's science. Mm-hmm. You know, now there are people in the FBI, they're publishing, researching in the area, um, and we see a lot more a lot more scientific interest in this whole area. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think we've come a long way. I think we've got a long ways to go. So it's mm-hmm. very exciting to be part of this. Yeah, it's uh, in this much time, in a, in, a, in a lifetime, it's gone from just a good, educated guest to now a, a true science where they are analyze, they're collecting data and analyzing variables to come to a conclusion. Yes, it is about science, and, 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 and that's what it needs to be. Uh, it can't just be uh, one, one person said, well, she's, I've, I've watched a lot of TV shows on Sheila Horner, and she's, I consider myself an expert. Uh-huh. I said, well, if you're an expert, I guess you don't need to be. You don't need me for anything. Uh-huh. You're an expert. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, you know, that's just the hubris of somebody who, of uh, people who think they know a lot because they've watched a couple shows on serial murder. And, can, and that's just that's just Hollywood. Mm-hmm. That's Hollywood. That's not science. Right. And uh, you had had some involvement uh, in the Ted Kaczynski case? Yes, I was your outside consultant. Mm-hmm. In, a, in a day, then I didn't realize they didn't use outside consultants. Uh-huh. Like my, my my wife is FBI, uh-huh. and she's she's a victim specialist for the bureau. But uh, uh, back in those days, uh, they, they never went outside the bureau. But uh, because of my, it was an interesting process. You know, I, I always take advantage <laughs> of opportunities. So I was back. I was in Chicago on the Jeffrey Dahmer case, uh-huh. and. I got a call from uh, media about the Ted Kaczynski case, you know, the year bomber. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't involved in any way at the time. So I, I couldn't really say too much. But after I hung up the phone, I thought, you know, maybe I can help these guys out. So I sat down in my hotel room and I wrote up, created a profile of the offender, who I thought he should be. And I operationalized it. Mm-hmm. And in other words, okay, he's a white guy, but what does a white guy do? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, who cares about what color he is at this point, but what is he actually doing? Mm-hmm. We look for him. So I, I gave him some ideas. And so anyway, I, I sent to him, I said, well, if this helps you, let me know. If it doesn't, then just throw it in the garbage. A week, well, oh, maybe five days later, I get a phone call from, they had a task force in San Francisco. And he said, Dr. Geek, we got your letter. You seem to know more about the case than our agents. How is that? <laughs> I said, well, it's easy. I'm the other blabber. Click. So, uh, uh, anyway, of course, they knew I wasn't because they'd already done, done checking out. So they came down to my office uh, in California, in, in, uh, in Fresno, and they brought two boxes of files. And they said, okay, so we asked, uh, asked a lot of best experts in, on this case. It's been 15 years now. We opened this new task force. And everyone says it's not solvable. Mm-hmm. What do you think? So I spent two hours and went through those boxes. It's all confidential. Mm-hmm. went through it all and at the end of it, I said well okay so let me tell you first of all the case is very solvable the problem is you're looking in the wrong area mm-hmm. and and so uh, and so that gives some ideas and thoughts and they went back to the task force and said we have this crazy professor who says it's solvable mm-hmm. and next thing I know a week, a week later I'm in San Francisco being sworn in on the case and after that I spent three years with them and they come down to my office um, I had some students involved at one time. I go up to San Francisco. We spend all day just talking about the case, mm-hmm. going back and forth. And when, and when the manifesto came out, uh, I immediately it was given to me. It was sent down to me. And I analyzed the, uh, the actual manifesto. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, but it was a great journey because I learned a lot about not just about the case, but I learned a lot about task forces and how they how they worked, how they didn't work very well, mm-hmm. and some of the problems they were facing. Um, and it was really an eye opener for me to be on the inside and but, but be an outsider. Mm-hmm. And uh, I liked that. Mm-hmm. So um, that worked out really well. I met some great people. And as a result of that, it's taken me on to some other really, really, mm-hmm. you know, I'll say, important missions. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's been a wonderful experience. And I really, I really was very uh, admiring of the agents and, and the work they were putting into that at the time. Mm-hmm. It seems like uh, with these kinds of cases and the way the agents work, it seems like you have, okay, you have profiling or uh, crime scene analysis of different types where we'll try and figure out something 
about the perpetrator. What is he like? What maybe where does he work? Uh, what kind of friends does he have? What kind of experience? What could we do to, to that if we found him, we could spot him with that profile? But then there is uh, in a few cases, and I think I would count the uh, Unabomber as one of them. We're actually doing something to get the perpetrator to do something, like for example, yeah. publish his manifesto and try and get a reaction from him or someone close to him. And and that is a you know that's like a discriminative stimulus added into the to the whole process. Exactly. To, yeah. Exactly. And, and it seemed like that. Well, that you know, go ahead. I was going to say you know in that particular case, uh, after the Obama was seen planting a bomb, he was in Salt Lake. He disappeared for six years. Uh huh. No, no, nobody heard from him. Everybody thought he was dead. Mm hmm. But then. The Oklahoma blast took place in the federal building in Oklahoma. Uh huh. Yeah. I remember telling my, my one of my colleagues, I said, I said, you wait. The Unabomber is going to hit soon. Watch. Uh huh. Within a week. Yeah. Yeah. And why did he hit? Because he was being forgotten. Yeah. He said, hey, you got those guys. You didn't get me. Uh huh. I'm still here. Uh huh. Because I, I said, this guy, I told, the, I told the task force, I said, this guy is um, a loner. Mm hmm. I said, he's a low self esteem. He's, bro- he's very bright. Um, but he's a loner. He doesn't like people. And, and he doesn't, no. And he's, of course, now in prison uh, for the rest of his life in Colorado, mm-hmm. in Florence, on Bomber Row. Mm-hmm. Uh, is he considered a serial killer, or is he a terrorist, or what is he, Ted, Ted Kaczynski, the universe? Well, he would be, he, uh, he'd be a serial killer. He, just, he was just smart. If he wasn't so smart, he wouldn't have done it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, he wasn't trying to be yeah, domestic terrorist. He had no agenda other than he felt unappreciated himself. Uh-huh. He, he was he would be an incel today. Um, uh-huh. You know he he wanted relationships, couldn't have them. He hated his mother. You know, those kinds of things. It, it wasn't political at all. Now, it wasn't religious or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So, but he wanted attention, and when he got it, he was all smiles. He mm-hmm. was all smiles. Mm-hmm. You have had a, another work about that you co-authored the myth of the psychiatric crime wave. Since I mean that that also yeah. seems timely because of all this stuff that we have in the media and on the news. So there's this perception that all these crazy people are committing all these crimes. Uh, can you tell us about that work a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so there is a common myth that if people who are insane, literally legally insane are the ones who commit most of the crimes. And that's not true. Mm-hmm. It's true that when we look at, look at active shooters, we see in mass, mur- in mass murders, for example, well, 40% of them have mental illness, okay? Mm-hmm. But, but that they're, that's relatively rare compared to the typical kinds of, you know, serial murders. Only 2% of serial murders are considered to be legally insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, two and a half percent. So what they do is crazy. Okay, we, we don't just but that's absolutely true. But what they do is, but they're not insane. They understand right from wrong. They they plan out. They're very careful in what what they do. Um, they they pick victims and so on. So they understand right from wrong. Um, whereas someone who can't think clearly make decisions, proper decisions, um, that's different. That's a different kind of offender. So mm-hmm. I, I think in this research, the idea was to just dispel some of the myths about that there's something terrible going to happen if that people have mental institutions. Well, we do see a lot of criminality, but low-level criminality, mm-hmm. uh, when you have people who are on the streets in San Francisco, for example, who are, have mental illness, and there's no one there to help them. And so eventually, you're, it's like a fire gig. Eventually, they're going to break into cars, they're going to hurt people, they're going to hurt themselves. Because most mentally ill people, if they're truly mentally ill, they're, they're psychotic, if they're dangerous, they're usually dangerous to themselves. They're more suicidal. They'll physically harm themselves. More likely to do that than to harm anybody else. Right. The ones that do harm other people, we make, we make movies about them. Right. Okay. Uh, and that's unfortunate. But that's yeah. But that's a relatively small population mm-hmm. um, to the number of people who just have personality disorders. Mm-hmm. That's not mental illness. That's a disorder. Personality mm-hmm. disorders are different. Mm-hmm. There's no medication for that. Mm-hmm. We can get people medication for being schizophrenic. Being psychotic, but mm-hmm. well, you can't give someone a pill for being a butthead, okay? Right. Having, having a, uh, a personality disorder mm-hmm. uh, where they are, uh, you know, antisocial. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that makes them happy again or better again. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, I've been asked before about the concept, the legal concept of insanity. It, it, that seems to, has always seemed to be an incredibly difficult thing to give an opinion on. If you're saying what the person's mental state was when this happened, and the, by the time you get around to examining them or testifying, that event is pretty far in the past. So is it is an insanity right. finding? Is that uh, it seems very difficult. Is it something we can really rely on? What's your opinion on that? Well, my opinion, and it's just an opinion. I'm not a therapist. Uh, I'm, I'm not a clinician that way. I, I'm a behavioral analyst. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I've interviewed people who are mentally ill, and I, you know, you've got a lot of criminals in my in my career. I, um, we know the insanity is the inability to dis- discern between right and wrong. Right. What's legal and illegal. And so some people, it's when people are mentally ill, not mentally ill all the time, they have moments of clarity. Right. They, they have moments when they're realizing that they're descending into the dark side. Mm-hmm. So were they mentally ill at the time and they, they couldn't distinguish between right and wrong? That's a good question. And so that's always the courts back and forth looking at whether they're able to work it on. And, and some, then you're really counting on the t- type of jury that you selected, how, how, good, how good are the attorneys in those areas. Uh, what are the psychiatric, psychiatric evaluations that are done, uh, and, and, and also the psychologist evaluations, mm-hmm. uh, what, what they're recommending. Mm-hmm. Of course, then it's always important to hire a psychologist who work both sides of the aisle. Uh-huh. They, they work both defense and prosecution, right. so it's not always the same outcome. Um, there's a lot of factors that weigh into this. You know, it's interesting when someone is actually convicted, well, I'm sorry, they sound in, insane, they're not, not they're, they're responsible, but not Criminally responsible, mm-hmm. uh, so they're they're not responsible by by fact they're insane. They end up doing as much time locked away in a, in a psych hospital as they would in prison. Right. So I don't know what the advantage is other than I guess you can have more freedom in a hospital. But I worked in a psych hospital for a few years, and I tell you, um, yeah. you can't turn your back on the patients ever, yeah. ever. Yeah. As, as you get get yourself killed. Right. So um, is it? Uh, I don't know. Is life there better? I guess in some ways it might be. I think if I had a choice, I, I suppose I, I would pick there. Uh, if I could kick my meds, you know, mm-hmm. I suppose. But not a happy life in, in, in a psych hospital. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, it is, as you say, there's a difficult, it's a vague, it's kind of murky at times trying to do things. But most people don't, don't go down that pathway mm-hmm. because it's a difficult one to prove. Mm-hmm. Most people do not choose insanity. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they try, but... In the end, they'll they'll feel free of it. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it's another one of these where these some of these insanity cases get a lot of media attention. For example, yeah. John Hinckley, but, who uh, yeah. uh, shot President Reagan, yeah. and that becomes well known as uh, uh, as an insanity defense. Yeah, Andrew Yates was another one. Mm, you're right. Yeah, based on her guilty, and, and it was partly because of the um, guilty in the beginning. In part because of the of the types of um, experts they had, and then you know, some things said in trial that weren't accurate, and then they did a retrial and they found it mentally ill, not guilty by reason of insanity, which was, which was actually true. She right. was mentally ill. She'd been mentally ill for a long time, right? And it'd been a long, long journey into mental illness. So she ended up going to a psych facility, uh, getting herself better. She still lives outside. Of, she's been released. Uh-huh. She still was outside the facility. She does work inside the facility, helping patients and so on. Uh-huh. But she, I mean, if anybody went to prison, it should be her husband. Uh-huh. It should be her husband. Yeah. And, and well, he's the one that encouraged her. He's the one that insisted, no, 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 we got to do it. It's God's will. Uh-huh. God's will that more kids. And every time they had another child, she became worse. Right. Yeah. What was it? A, was it a postpartum yeah. psychosis type of case? Was that? Was yes, her... postpartum psychosis. Yeah. Exactly, and she got worse and worse. And the, there's a long history of that. Th- this is uh, the, the Andrea Ra- that Yates. Extended. The Andrea Yates that drowned her. I think she drowned five of her children. She drowned all five children. Yeah, yeah all drowned all five of her children in in a psychotic state. Yes, she was psychotic, but she did absolutely psychotic. Mm-hmm. She wasn't. She wasn't a bad person. Andrea was never a bad person. She just uh, became mentally ill. Over time, and so she paid terrible price for it, as did everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what could uh, 
with the information that you have in a book like Myth of the Psychiatric uh, Crime Wave, how can that um, impact, you think, in a positive way, the sentencing recommendations for the mentally ill defendants that are fair and humane and, and based on facts? Well, I, again, the whole point, I mean, I'm not an advocate, but, but I am. I do want to protect people who cannot protect themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, 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 you know, it's just a rush to judgment that people must be crazy when they do things, and most times they're not. Mm-hmm. But those who are truly mentally ill, that can be easily, that, you know, that can be determined through testing and through, you know, looking at their, their backgrounds mm-hmm. and their profiles. Mm-hmm. So I want people who are truly mentally ill to be treated properly and get the medications and the attention they actually need. Um, and I want people who are not mentally ill not to be able to use that as a way of getting out of, of, your, of, just, of justice. Mm-hmm. We had a previous podcast. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we had a previous podcast of uh, in New York City, the Darius McCullum case, where a, a filmmaker had done a documentary where this guy had uh, uh, stolen subway cars and buses so, so on some 30 different occasions. And he uh, he was uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, what was then Asperger's disorder. He'd memorized the whole New York City subway system and uh, the bus system, and just took people on their appointed rounds. They took people on the schedule, same schedule of the. Didn't hurt anyone. Didn't didn't. Uh, as far as we know, never stole anything. Just got it in his head that he ought to go around and run the buses and the subways. And I'm thinking, what do you do in a case like? You obviously, they were going to give him a life sentence for these numerous felonies. But what do you do in a case like this that is a humane and... Fa- and well, I'm, yeah, I mean, to me, that's someone who needs to be treated in a psych hospital. Yeah. You know, because uh, it's very, very specific mental illness. Yeah. Um, that's not someone you, you put into a prison with, with, with uh, killers, uh-huh. uh, with uh, con artists and so on. There's, there's a different kind of... You know, you have to help them put them into prison. Mm-hmm. You, you'd also had to work on uh, controversial issues in criminology, and among the things that are covered there are, uh, I've heard this before, should prostitution be legalized? Are stalking laws effective? Is, uh, uh, is medical treatment a useful way to deal with criminal offenders? Can you tell us about that work, controversial issues in criminology? Well... Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh-huh. Uh, since then, I've done a lot of work. I've done some work on in the area of stalking. Uh-huh. Very much interested in the types of who are stalkers and domestic and stranger stalkers and so on. Uh-huh. Um, there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of research done on some of these topics at the time. Right. And so they were controversial. I mean, in some in some ways, they we have more light on them now than, than we did then. Uh-huh. So. Uh, it was a co-edited book with Dr. John Fuller, mm-hmm. a close friend of mine, and he has since retired. But uh, so it, it, there's something specific that, because there's a lot of articles in there. Mm-hmm. Is there something in particular that you want me to talk about? Uh, do you th- do you think prostitution should be legalized? I, I've heard that controversy before, um, and I've heard oh, data. Oh, 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 do I think? Oh, well, no, actually. So my doctor, my good friend John Fuller, would probably say yes because he's pretty much a liberal. Yeah, and the public think it's a good idea, uh, and, and uh, but I I don't think it should be because I, I mean, it's like legalizing everything else. I mean, we legalize enough drugs and so on. Next thing you know, um, like you know, we we have more and more problems. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it should be legalized, but I do think that we should consider how we treat prostitutes. Um, it's mm-hmm. not like women mostly choose prostitution as a great lifestyle right. or the career. Most of them do not do that. Most of mm-hmm. them do it out of desperation. Mm-hmm. To me, these are not criminals. They shouldn't be in prison. They, I, and I, yeah, I been over to the South Shore prison a few times in my lifetime in California, mm-hmm. uh, prison for women. You know, if I were in charge, I'd put two thirds of them probably in institutions where they get treatment for their for their addictions and their drugs and and uh, other kinds of issues. But prostitution is. To me, uh, these are women who are hard desperate, and, and most of them, not all of them, but, but most of them, and I'd like to find a better way to help them and mm-hmm. who feel a need to go down that pathway. And, and again, and go after the pimps who are you know, corralling them when, they, when, they, when they're runaways. 
Mm-hmm. If they come, someone comes from, well, comes from abusive homes and they run away, and then picks them up at, at airports or, I mean, or at bus stations, mm-hmm. train stations, and so on, next thing you know, they're, 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 they're tied into prostitution mm-hmm. and, and human trafficking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we really kind of turned things around the past 10, 15 years about human trafficking. Now, human trafficking is organized crime. Right. And, and women are being exploited. Uh, and, you know, there's there some gray areas there, sure. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I think, and it's true that when some of these young women are, are, are it's, they're, they're actually saved from human trafficking, like the FBI goes and gets them, often these women after they're, 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 uh, they're retrieved, rescued, they'll end up going back in, into it. Right. Because they feel like there's someone there who cares about them, you know, the pimp cares about them. Yeah. But, all the kids cares about is money. You yeah. know, that's all he cares about. Yeah, and so, o- often these uh, women... To, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and, and you know, to some extent, we have created this problem mm-hmm. uh, in, in America, in, in all countries. All countries have prostitution. We create it because we create demand for it. And we, we uh, uh, even the people who are calling for reforms, some of them are part of the problem. They're not part of the answer. Mm-hmm. So it, it is a very dark area to get into because, well... People are talking about people talking about both sides of their mouth. They say, "Well, I, I want to want to fix the problem," but actually, they're also going to prostitutes themselves. They're called girls and so on. Yeah. And, and rather than addressing the real issue, that the human issue about these women, yeah, these poor women who are are suffering and are debasing themselves in order to make money to pay for their children, for their, for their drugs, and so on. Um, and I just, yeah, I for me, I, I have a moral issue with this, and, and I want to help women uh, rather than punish them. Mm-hmm. Um, this is how I would approach it. But that's just me. You know, I, I have one opinion, I mean, there's lots of opinions out there. Yeah. So, prostitution. Cool, prostitution is a crime where the people that commit the crime are also the victims of it. Yeah, exactly right. There's, yeah, I mean, we call them victims of crimes, yeah. Mm-hmm. But there's no real victims, but yet, yeah, women are the victims. Yeah. Well, they're consenting adults. Yeah. So, a lot of them are not adults, a lot of them are teenagers. Yeah, uh, but even that doesn't matter. That we can we can do better as yeah. a society. We can do better. Right. Yeah. Do you, Do you think that the legalization of I don't know if you've written on this, but the legalization of marijuana is that comparable to ending prohibition for alcohol, or uh, is the legalization of drugs uh, an entirely different thing than uh, when prohibition? And uh, I hear that comparison a lot. Well. But. Yeah, as my best friend uh, John Fuller says, hey, what are you teaching this course in drug use and abuse for? You don't use drugs. You don't, you don't smoke. Mm-hmm. So that's true. I, I, I never use illegal drugs. I don't smoke. I don't use alcohol at all, ever. So these are areas I'm not, I haven't walked the walk. Right. Okay. I, I do have opinions. I do have opinions about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that because we are, uh, you know, increasingly more permissive society, and I, and I do believe that people should be able to make choices about pornography, they make choices about alcohol and drug use and so on, as long as it doesn't affect the rest of the community. Mm-hmm. I think that legalizing marijuana doesn't change a whole lot of things, because people are going to be using it no matter what, whether it's legal or not. Mm-hmm. They're going to use it. I don't think it's going to be, that going to be a big rush of people who want to try it. But with that said, there's going to be all those who have wanted to use it legally are now using it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's going to affect productivity somewhat. Uh, people who are using marijuana on a daily basis are not as productive. We know from research, they're not as productive. Right. Um, and so, and if I was an employer, and I knew that my employee was using marijuana on the job, I, I would find a way to get, get rid of him. Right. You know? I mean, because I, I, I know he's not going to be as productive, or she's not going to be as productive. Mm-hmm. But that's just me. I mean, I'm, again, I'm old school, and maybe this is where the country's going to go. In California, everyone's a choke up. No, yeah. yeah. Well, I I've been living in Michigan, and they and they recently legalized marijuana. Yes, yes, and in Cal- in Colorado and uh-huh. things like that, and in Cal- Cal- California certainly. Uh, you know, there's lots of places now that sell marijuana, and you know, and I I think funny. I picked up a hitchhiker recently. I, I like to go to hitchhikers. I always find it very interesting to talk to. Uh-huh. And this one guy I picked up recently, he, he, he said, I, I started growing marijuana when I was 14, so I'm 50 years old today, and I've been in and out of prison many, many times because of marijuana. And, and he said, uh, he says, now, 
So the only thing I went to prison for, now I, I don't get arrested anymore. Now, I will get arrested for growing it illegally, but it is, it's odd that I can sit here and I can smoke marijuana now, uh-huh. uh, whereas before I couldn't. Right. And I go to prison for it, and, and often took for several years at a time. Mm-hmm. So I said, yeah, times are changing. And so, you know, part of me, you know, part of me being a little bit liberal on that part, he said, well, you know, people should be able to make some choices, mm-hmm. but but not to the point where it's going to harm our society so for, for the greater good. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to consider that. Um, you know, again, I, I'm not sure why people do. I, I guess I do know why people use drugs. Mm-hmm. It, it takes the, the pain away from life. It makes you more mellow and so on, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But I like to experience life. I, I like the idea of being alive. Right. And, and experiencing, you know, the pain as well as, as the joy of life. Right. And, and being alert. And I, to me, that's really, really important. Mm-hmm. I, I see where, I can see why people use drugs. I totally understand. Right. That post-traumatic stress disorder, people can come back from combat, people in near-death experiences, people who are stressed out about life, uh, finances. I, I get that. I, I truly do. But my pathway is just to fight through it, fight through it and find my own way. But, I, I can see where a lot of people would have a hard time with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think one of the one of the arguments that gets made is all the people that are arrested. They look at the statistics for all the people arrested for marijuana use, and then they say, "Well, uh, why why are we spending all these resources arresting them for this?" But I think that might be just a little bit misleading because that implies that the police just won't find some other reason to arrest some of these same people. Like it, it, whatever the statistics are for marijuana, <coughs> excuse me, it's not necessarily going to get reduced that much just because you legalize smoking a joint. Right, right. I mean, there'll always there'll always be criminal justice. There'll always be prisons. Yeah. There'll always be people being arrested. Um, it's part of our industry, right? And and uh, and we are going to make making choices that don't always we don't always agree with, right? So uh, you know those are kind of the edges of society that I tend to stay away from. But, yeah, uh, I can see why. I mean, I have I have many friends who have smoked or smoke dope. Um, I, I don't encourage it. I don't participate in it. Um, I just know that that's what they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't, I mean, that, those are issues that we depart on. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't make them less my friends. Right. Um, I still appreciate them for who they are, what they do in their lives, and um, they're great colleagues. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not something I would choose to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm intrigued that you are someone that studies serial killers, and yet you like to pick up hitchhikers. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. I, I often do, and I usually I, I look for people specifically who, like the last three guys I picked up, I, I said that guy looks like he just got out of prison. And three times I said that, and all three times he just got out of prison. I was right, either prison or jail. I was right on, and they're all on their way home, and uh, one from prison, two from jails. And I had some great conversations with them. Uh, of course, I, I I know how to handle them in my car. I mean, with, with my wife, I never pick anybody up, but but right. when I'm alone. And I get a chance to get someone like that. I get to do an interview, right? And that means that at some point they're going to be in one of my books. Uh-huh. And, and I know that it can be very dangerous to do that to people up. But I also preempt myself. I always preempt it, so I stay in control of the interview. Uh-huh. So because you, know, you know that at some point they're going to get that job in nice car, they're going to figure out, hey, this guy's got money. Uh-huh. I know they're going to want money. Uh-huh. So I always ask them before you get a chance. To, I said, so I suppose you're going to need some money. And they always say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I want to give you some money. He goes, well, no one ever said that to me. You know, so I take my control. Uh-huh. And then they say, well, I said, well, how much do you want? They, the guy goes, well, I don't know. Wow, can you spare 20 bucks? Uh-huh. And I said, no, but I'll give you $100. I always give him 100 bucks. <laughs> and they go, why so much? Why would you do that? I said, look, I just had a 45-minute interview with you. Uh-huh. I mean, you didn't know it, but you're going to be in my next book. <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to give this money because that was a great interview. Uh-huh. And, and I'm going to thank you for your, your help. And, and so they can't believe it. And they get out of the car, give them 100 bucks, and off they go. And I'll, I'm alive there. I'm, no one gets hurt. They get 100 bucks, and they're in my next book. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it becomes. It, it works a, out really well. It becomes a productive transaction. It, it really is. Yeah. 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 It has worked out <laughs> quite well in my life. And I've interviewed a lot of people that way. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, the, the plane's gone up. I can do a little bit more now, but yeah. they used to. Yeah. They had more money on CPF. But, yeah. you know, these, these are guys who can use the money. I mean, they're on the way home from prison or jail. They had yeah. no money. So uh, they're always very appreciative. Right. Well, I'd never thought of it quite like that. I, I've been speaking to you for uh, almost an hour now. Uh, at this point in your career, uh, do you have upcoming books or research that are that maybe we ought to be uh, aware of, or, or where are you at right now? Well, um, I am actually, I'm working with the um, Department of Defense. Uh-huh. And uh, so I, I can't get into detail about it, but my job with them is to help reduce serious and violent crime in, in the military. Uh-huh. Because we're seeing a lot of different types of criminals now inside the military. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've been brought into the military to work on that project. And so that's what I'm doing. And so that's it. That's, you know, we'll be publishing from that. We'll be making some recommendations to Congress and so on. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a big, huge project to on. I've got a, a team of people that I've brought into the project from around the country, the PhD types who are researchers mm-hmm. um, who understand what I want mm-hmm. and uh, how we're going to revamp some of the training programs they have and things that will impact recruitment and so on. So it's, it's been, um, and the reason I got that because someone saw me on TV in the military and they said, we want that guy. Uh-huh. And that's how I got into this. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm doing that, and, and so I'll be publishing from that. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a second edition of my Sex Crimes book. I, it's about time now to do a third edition of my, uh, an eighth edition of my Sierra Motor book. It's about that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm just really busy. <laughs> yeah. Take time somehow. Uh, but um, so there'll be those kind of things. I have worked on different projects with students. I, I work on a lot of dissertations with students at a Walton University. Mm-hmm. And um, some of them are on the dark side. So yeah. uh, some of those students will want to co- co-author articles and so on. Right. Well, we, yeah, I, I'm so glad you gave us the opportunity to speak with you. It's a wide, uh, wide-ranging uh, set of topics here. Uh, I, it's, it's intrigued me. I'm not sure I'm going to pick up hitchhikers to get an interview, but uh, you know, <laughs> no, I don't recommend you do. Yeah. I don't recommend anybody pick up hitchhikers, right? Um, unless they had experience doing it, and they, you know, they can handle them. They know how to do it. Otherwise, it could be quite dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is intriguing. So, Doctor Hick. Well, thank you for for calling me. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, talking with you. I appreciate you giving us the interview, and hopefully, maybe uh, we there's you know so much that we could interview again sometime in the future. You, Jim, you're always welcome anytime. Okay, thank you. Have a great rest of your weekend, Doctor Hickey. Take care, my friend. We'll talk, we'll talk to you again. Okay. has been Criminal Behaviorology. Check us out on podomatic.com or anchor.fm. Please send questions, comments, and requests for transcripts to criminalbehaviorology at gmail.com.